Saint Maximus the Confessor. 400 texts on love. The second century. In other words, the second hundred texts out of 400. Number one. He who truly loves God prays entirely without distraction. And he who prays entirely without, without distraction loves God truly. But he whose intellect is fixed on any worldly thing does not pray without distraction. And consequently, he does not love God. 2. The intellect that dallies with some sensible thing clearly is attached to it by some passion such as desire, irritation, anger, or rancor. And unless it becomes detached from that thing, it will not be able to free itself from the passion affecting it. 3. When the passions dominate the intellect, they separate it from God, binding it to material things and preoccupying it with them. But when love of God dominates the intellect, it frees it from its bonds, persuading it to rise above not only sensible things, but even this transitory life. 4. The effect of observing the commandments is to free from passion our conceptual images of things. The effect of spiritual reading and contemplation is to detach the intellect from form and matter. It is this which gives rise to undistracted prayer. 5. Unless various successive spiritual contemplations also occupy the intellect, the practice of the virtues by itself cannot free it so entirely from passions that it is able to pray undistractedly. Practice of the virtues frees the intellect only from the dissipation in hatred. Spiritual contemplation releases it also from forgetfulness and ignorance. In this way, the intellect can pray as it should. 6. Two states of pure prayer are exalted above all others. One is to be found in those who have not advanced beyond the practice of the virtues, the other in those leading the contemplative life. The first is engendered in the soul by fear of God and a firm hope in Him, the second by an intense longing for God and by total purification. The sign of the first is that the intellect, Abandoning all conceptual images of the world, concentrates itself in praise without distraction or disturbance, as if God himself were present, as indeed he is. The sign of the second is that at the very onset of prayer, the intellect is so ravished by the divine and infinite light that it is aware neither of itself nor of any other created thing, but only of him who through love has activated such radiance in it. It is then that being made aware of God's qualities, it receives clear and distinct reflections of Him. 7. Whatever a man loves, he inevitably clings to, and, and in order not to lose it, he rejects everything that keeps him from it. So he who loves God cultivates pure prayer, driving out every passion that keeps him from it. 8. He who drives out self-love the mother of the passions, will with God's help easily rid himself of the rest, such as anger, irritation, rancor, and so on. But he who is dominated, dominated by self-love is overpowered by the other passions, even against his will. Self-love is the passion of attachment to the body. 9. Men love one another, commendably or reprehensibly, for the following five reasons. Either for the sake of God, as the virtuous man loves everyone, and as the man not yet virtuous loves the virtuous. Or by nature, as parents love their children, and children their parents. Or because of self-esteem, as he who is praised loves the man who praises him. Or because of avarice, as with one who loves a rich man for what he can get out of him, or because of self-indulgence, as with the man who serves his belly in his genitals. The first of these is commendable, the second is of an intermediate kind, and the rest are dominated by passion. 10. 
If there are some men you hate and some you neither love nor hate, and others you love strongly and others again you love but moderately, recognize from this inequality that you are far from perfect love. For perfect love presupposes that you love all men equally. 11. Shun evil and do good. Psalm 34 verse 14. That is to say, fight the enemy in order to diminish the passions, and then be vigilant lest they increase once more. Again, fight to acquire the virtues, and then be vigilant in order to keep them. This is the meaning of cultivating and keeping. Genesis 2 verse 15. 12. Those permitted by God to test us either inflame the desiring aspect of the soul, or stir up its insensive power, or darken its intelligence, or envelop its body in pain, or deprive us of bodily necessities. 13. The demons either tempt us themselves, or arm against us those who have no fear of the Lord. They tempt us themselves when we withdraw from human society, as they tempted our Lord in the desert. They tempt us through other people when we spend our time in the company of others, as they tempted our Lord through the Pharisees. But whichever line of attack, attack they choose, let us repel them by keeping our gaze fixed on the Lord's example. 14. When the intellect begins to advance in the love for God, the demon of blasphemy starts to tempt it, suggesting thoughts such as no man but only the devil, their father, could invent. He does this out of envy, so that the man of God, in his despair at thinking such thoughts, no longer dares to soar up to God in his accustomed prayer. But the demon does not further his own ends by this means. On the contrary, he makes us more steadfast. For through his attacks and our retaliation, we grow more experienced and genuine in our love for God. May his sword enter into his own heart, and may his bows be broken. Psalm 37 verse 15 15. When the intellect turns its attention to the visible world, it perceives things through the medium of the senses in a way that accords with nature. And the intellect is not evil, nor is its natural capacity to form conceptual images of things, nor are the things themselves, nor are the senses, for all are the work of God. What then is evil? Clearly, it is the passion that enters into the conceptual images formed in accordance with nature by the intellect, and this need not happen if the intellect keeps watch. 16. Passion is an impulse of the soul contrary to nature, as in the case of mindless love, or mindless hatred for someone, or for some sensible thing. In the case of love, it may be for needless food, or for a woman, or for money, or for transient glory, or for other sensible objects, or on their account. In the case of hatred, it may be for any of the things mentioned, or for someone on account of these things. 17. Again, vice is the wrong use of our conceptual images of things, which leads us to misuse the things themselves. In relation to women, for example, sexual intercourse rightly used has its purpose of begetting children. He, therefore, who seeks in it only sensual pleasure uses it wrongly, for he reckons as good what is not good. When such a man has intercourse with a woman, he misuses her. And the same is true with regard to other things, and our conceptual images of them. 18. When the demons expel self-restraint from your intellect, and besiege you with thoughts of unchastity, turn to the Lord with tears, and say, Now they have driven me out and encircled me. Psalm 17, verse 11 of the Septuagint. Thou art my supreme joy, deliver me from those who encircle me. Psalm 32, verse 7 of the Septuagint. Then you will be safe. 19. The demon of unchastity is powerful and violently attacks those who struggle against passion, particularly if they are lax about matters of diet and often meet women. With the lubricity of sensual pleasure, he imperceptibly steals into the intellect and thereafter persecutes the hesychast by means of the memory, setting his body on fire and presenting various forms to his intellect. 
In this way, he evokes his ascent to sin. If you do not want these forms to linger in you, turn again to fasting, labor, vigils, and blessed stillness with intense prayer. 20. Those who are always trying to lay hold of our soul do so by means of impassioned thoughts, so that they may drive it to sin either in mind or in action. Consequently, when they find the intellect unreceptive, they will be disgraced and put to shame, and when they find the intellect occupied with spiritual contemplation, they will be, they will be turned back and suddenly ashamed. Psalm 6 verse 10 21. He who anoints his intellect for spiritual contest and drives all impassioned thoughts out of it has the quality of a deacon. He who illuminates his intellect with the knowledge of created beings and utterly destroys false knowledge has the quality of a priest. And he who perfects his intellect with the holy myrrh of the knowledge and worship of the Holy Trinity has the quality of a bishop. 22. The demons are weakened when the passions in us decrease through our keeping of the commandments, and they are defeated totally when they are routed by dispassion, for, for then they no longer find anything through which they can enter the soul and fight against it. This is what is meant by, They will be weakened and defeated before thy face. Psalm 9 verse 3 23 Some men abstain from the passions because of human fear, others because of self-esteem, and others through self-control. Some, however, are delivered from the passions by divine providence. 24. All the discourses of our Lord contain these four elements, commandments, doctrines, threats, and promises. With the help of these, we patiently accept every kind of hardship, such as fasting, vigils, sleeping on the ground, toil and labor in acts of service, insults, dishonor, torture, death, and so on. Helped by the words of thy lips, says the psalmist, I have kept the difficult paths. Psalm 17, verse 4 of the Septuagint. 25. The reward of self-control is dispassion, and the reward of faith is spiritual knowledge. Dispassion engenders discrimination, and spiritual knowledge engenders love for God. 26. When the intellect practices the virtues correctly, it advances in moral understanding. When it practices contemplation, it advances in spiritual knowledge. The first leads the spiritual contestant to discriminate between virtue and vice. The second leads the participant to the inner qualities of incorporeal and corporal things. Finally, the intellect is granted the grace of theology. When carried on wings of love beyond these two former things, it is taken up into God and with the help of the Holy Spirit, discerns as far as this is possible for the human intellect, the qualities of God. 27. If you are about to enter the realm of theology, do not seek to decry, to decry God's inmost nature, for neither the human intellect nor that of any other being under God can experience this. But try to discern, as far as possible, the qualities that appertain to his nature, qualities of eternity, infinity, indeterminateness, goodness, wisdom, and the power of creating, preserving, and judging creatures, and so on. For he who discovers these qualities, to however small an extent, is a great theologian. 28. He who combines the practice of the virtues with spiritual knowledge is a man of power. For with the first, he withers his desire and tames his insensiveness, and with the second, he gives wings to his intellect and goes out of himself to God. 29. When our Lord says, I and my Father are one, John 10 verse 30, he indicates their identity of essence. Again, when he says, I am in the Father, and the Father in me, John 14, verse 11, he shows that the persons cannot be divided. The tritheists, footnote number one, here St. Maximus is attacking the theories of John Philoponus, 6th century. The tritheists, therefore, who divide the Son from the Father, find themselves in a dilemma. Either they say that the Son is co-eternal with the Father, but nevertheless divide him from the Father, and so they are forced to say that he is not begotten from the Father. Thus they fall into the error of claiming that there are three gods and three prince first principles. 
Or else they say that the Son is begotten from the Father, but nevertheless divide him from the Father. And so they are forced to say that he is not co-eternal with the Father. Thus they make the Lord of time subject to time. For as St. Gregory of Nazianzus says, footnote 1 says, or a, the Gregory of Nazianzus, Orations 20, number 6. It is necessary both to maintain the one God and to confess the three persons, each in, each in his own individuality. According to St. Gregory, the divinity is divided but without division, and is united but without distinctions. Because of this, both the division and the union are paradoxical. For what paradox would there be if the Son were united to the Father and divided from Him only in the same manner as one human being is united to and divided from another, and nothing more? 30. For Him who is perfect in love and has reached the summit of this passion, there is no difference between his own or another's, or between Christians and unbelievers, or between slave and free, or between, or even between male and female. But because he has risen above the tyranny of the passions and has fixed his attention on the single nature of man, he looks on, he looks on all in the same way and shows the same dispositions to all. For in him there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free, but Christ who is all and in all. Colossians 3 verse 11 and Galatians 3 verse 28. 31. The passions lying hidden in the soul provide the demons with the means of arousing impassioned thoughts in us. Then fighting the intellect through these thoughts, they force it to give its assent to sin. When it has been overcome, they lead it to sin in the mind. And when this has been done, they induce it, captive as it is, to commit the sin in action. Having thus desolated the soul by means of these thoughts, the demons then retreat, taking the thoughts with them, and only the specter or idol of sin remains in the intellect. Referring to this, our Lord says, When you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, let him who reads understand. Matthew 24, verse 15. For man's intellect is a holy place and a temple of God in which the demons, having desolated the soul by means of impassioned thoughts, set up the idol of sin. That these things, that these things already take, that these things have already taken place in history, no one, I think, who has read Josephus will doubt. Footnote: Josephus, Jewish historian of the first century A.D. See especially his Jewish War, number 6. Though some say that they will also come to pass in the time of the Antichrist. 32. There are three things that impel us towards what is holy. Natural instincts, angelic powers, and probity of intention. Natural instincts impel us when, for example, we do to others what we wish what we would wish them to do to us Luke six verse thirty one or when we see someone suffering deprivation or in need and naturally feel compassion. Angelic powers impel us when being ourselves impelled to something worthwhile, we find we are providentially helped and guided. We are impelled by probity of intention when discriminating between good and evil, we choose the good thirty three there are also three things that impel us towards evil, passions, demons, and the sinfulness of intention. Passions impel us when, for example, we desire something beyond what is reasonable, such as food which is unnecessary or untimely, or a woman who is not our wife for a purpose other than procreation, or else when we are excessively angered or irritated by, for instance, someone who has dishonored or injured us. Demons impel us when, for example, they catch us off our guard and suddenly launch a violent attack upon us, stirring up the passions already mentioned in others of similar nature. We are impelled by sinfulness of intention when, knowing the good, we choose evil instead. 34. The rewards for toils of virtue are dispassion and spiritual knowledge, for these are mediators of the kingdom of heaven. Just as passions and ignorance are the mediators of eternal punishment, 
It is because of this that he who seeks these rewards for the sake of human glory and not for their intrinsic goodness is rebuked by the words of Scripture. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. James 4 verse 3 35 Many human activities, good in themselves, are not good because of the motive for which they are done. For example, fasting and vigils, prayer and psalmody, acts of charity and hospitality, are by nature good, but when performed for the sake of self-esteem, they are not good. 36. In everything that we do, God searches out our purpose, to see whether we do it for Him, or for some other motive. 37. When you hear the words of Scripture, Thou shalt render to every man according to his work. Psalm 62, verse 12 of the Septuagint. Do not think that God bestows blessings when, someone is when something is done for the wrong purpose, even though it seems to be good. Quite clearly, He bestows blessings only when something is done for the right purpose. For God's judgment looks not at the actions, but at the purpose behind them. 38. The malice of the demon of pride takes two forms. Either he persuades the monk to ascribe his achievements to himself and not to God, the giver of all goodness and helper in every achievement, or if he fails this, he suggests that he should belittle those of his brethren, who are as yet less perfect than himself. Influenced in this way, he does not realize that the demon is persuading him to deny God's help. For if he belittles his brethren for their lack of achievement, he clearly infers that he has achieved something through his own powers. But this is impossible, since as our Lord has said, Without me you can do nothing. John 15 verse 5 For even when impelled towards what is good, our weakness cannot bring anything to fruition without the giver of all goodness. 39. The person who has come to know the weakness of human nature has gained experience of divine power. Such a man, having achieved some things and eager to achieve others through this divine power, never belittles anyone. For he knows that just as God has helped him and freed him from many passions and difficulties, so when God wishes, he is able to help all men, especially those pursuing the spiritual way for his sake. And if in his providence he does not deliver all men together from their passions, yet, like a good and loving physician, he heals with individual treatment each of those who are trying to make progress. 40. We grow proud when the passions cease to be active in us. In this, whether they are inactive because their causes have been eradicated, or because the demons have deliberately withdrawn in order to deceive us. 41. Almost every sin is committed for the sake of sensual pleasure, and sensual pleasure is overcome by hardship and distress arising either voluntary from repentance or else involuntary as a result of some solitary and providential reversal. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, so that we should not be condemned with the world. 1 Corinthians 11 verses 31 to 32. 42. When a trial comes upon you unexpectedly, do not blame the person through whom it came, but try to discover the reason why it came, and then you will find a way of dealing with it. For whether through this person or through someone else you had in any case to drink the worm of God's judgments. 45. As long as you have bad habits, do not reject hardship, so that through it you may be humbled and eject your pride. 44. Sometimes men are tested by pleasure, sometimes by distress, or by physical suffering. By means of his prescriptions, the physician of souls administers the remedy according to the cause of the passions lying hidden in the soul. 45. Trials are sent to some so as to take away past sins, to others so as to eradicate sins now being committed, and yet to others so as to forestall sins which may be committed in the future. These are distinct from the trials that arise in order to test men in the way that Job was tested. 46. The sensible man, taking into account the remedial effect of the divine prescriptions, gladly bears the sufferings which they bring upon him, since he is aware that they are no cause, that they have no cause other than his own sin. But when the fool, ignorant of the supreme wisdom of God's providence, sins and is corrected, 
He regards either God or men as responsible for the hardships he suffers. 47. Certain things stop the movement of the passions and do not allow them to grow. Others subdue them and make them diminish. For instance, where desire is concerned, fasting, labors, and vigils do not allow it to grow. While withdrawal, contemplation, prayer, and intense longing for God subdue it and make it disappear. The same is true with regard to anger. For, forbearance, freedom from rancor, gentleness, for example, all arrest it and prevent it from growing, while love, acts of charity, kindness, and compassion make it diminish. 48. When a man's intellect is constantly with God, his desire grows beyond all measure into an intense longing for God, and his insensiveness is completely transformed into divine love. For by continual participation in the divine radiance, his intellect becomes totally filled with light, and when it has reintegrated its passable aspect, it directs this aspect towards God, as we have said, filling it with an incomprehensible and intense longing for him, and with unceasing love, thus drawing it entirely away from worldly things to the divine. 49. If a man is not envious or angry, and does not bear a grudge against someone who has offended him, that does not necessarily mean that he loves him. For while still lacking love, he may be capable of not repaying evil with evil, in accordance with the commandment, Romans 12, verse 17, and yet by no means be capable of rendering good for evil without forcing himself. To be, upon, to be spontaneously disposed to do good to those who hate you, Matthew 5, verse 44, belongs to perfect spiritual love alone. 50. If a man does not love someone, it does not necessarily mean that he hates him, and conversely, if he does not hate him, it does not necessarily mean that he loves him, since he can be neutral towards him, that is, neither love nor hate him. For the disposition to love is created only in the five ways listed in the ninth text of this century, one commendable, one of an intermediate kind, and three reprehensible. 51. When you find your intellect occupied pleasurably with material things and becoming fondly attached to its conceptual images of them, you may be sure that you love these things more than God. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew 6, verse 21. 52. The intellect joined to God for long periods through prayer and love becomes wise, good, powerful, compassionate, merciful, and long-suffering. In short, it includes within itself almost all of the divine qualities. But when the intellect withdraws from God and attaches itself to material things, either it becomes self-indulgent like some domestic animal, or like a wild beast, it fights with men for the sake of these things. 53. Scripture calls material things the world, and worldly men are those who occupy their intellect with these things. It is such men that Scripture rebukes when it says, Do not love the world or the things that are in the world, the desire of the flesh and the desire of the eyes and the pride in one's possessions, are not of God, but are of the world. 1 John 2, verses 15 to 16. 54. A monk is a man who has freed his intellect from attachment to material things, and by means of self-control, love, psalmody, and prayer cleaves to God. 55. The herdsman signifies the man's practicing the virtues, for moral achievements may be represented by cattle. That is why Jacob said, Your servants are herdsmen. Genesis 46, verse 34. The shepherd signifies the Gnostic, for sheep represent thoughts pastured by the intellect on the mountains of contemplation. That is why every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Genesis 46, verse 34. That is, to the demonic powers. 56. When the body is urged by the senses to indulge its own desires and pleasures, the corrupted intellect readily succumbs in a sense to its impassioned fantasies and impulses, but the regenerated intellect exercises self-control and withholds itself from them. Moreover, as a true philosopher, it studies how to rectify such impulses. 57. 
There are virtues of the body and virtues of the soul. Those of the body include fasting, vigils, sleeping on the ground, ministering to people's needs, working with one's hands so as not to be a burden or in order to give to others. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 9 and Ephesians 4 verse 28. Those of the soul include love, long-suffering, gentleness, self-control, and prayer. Galatians 5 verse, 50, 5 verse 22. If as a result of some, some constraint or bodily con condition, such as illness or the like, we find we cannot practice the bodily virtues mentioned above, we are forgiven by the Lord because He knows the reasons. But if we fail to practice the virtues of the soul, we shall not have a single excuse, for it is always within our power to practice them. 58. Love for God leads him who shares in it to be indifferent to every transient pleasure and every labor and distress. Let all the saints who have suffered joyfully so much for Christ convince you of this. 59. Guard yourself from that mother of vices, self-love which is mindless love for the body. For it gives birth with spacious justification to the three first and most general of the impassioned thoughts, I mean those of gluttony, avarice, and self-esteem, which take as their pretext some so-called need of the body. All further vices are generated by these three. You must therefore be on your guard, as we have already said, and fight against self-love with great vigilance, but when this vice is eradicated, all the others are eradicated too. 60. The passion of self-love suggests to the monk that he should have pity on his body, and in the name of its proper care and governance, should take food more often than is fitting. For in this way, self-love will lead him on, step by step, to fall into the pit of self-indulgence. On, on the other hand, self-love prompts those who are not monks to fulfill the body's desire, desires at once. 61. It is said that the highest state of prayer is reached when the intellect goes beyond the flesh and the world, and while praying is utterly free from matter and form. He who maintains this state has truly attained unceasing prayer. 62. When the body dies, it is wholly separated from the things of this world. Similarly, when the intellect dies while in that supreme state of prayer, it is separated from conceptual images of this world. If it does not die such a death, it cannot be with God and live with Him. 63. Let no one deceive you, monk, with the notion that you can be saved while a slave to sensual pleasure and self-esteem. 64. When the body sins through material things, it has the bodily virtues to teach it self-restraint. Similarly, when the intellect sins through impassioned conceptual images, it has the virtues of the soul to instruct it, so that by seeing things in a pure and dispassionate way, it too may learn self-restraint. 65. Just as night follows day and winter summer, so does stress and pain follow self-esteem and sensual pleasure, either in this life or after death. 66. No sinner can escape future judgment without experiencing in this life either voluntary hardships or afflictions he has not chosen. 67. There are said to be five reasons why God allows us to be assailed by demons. The first is so that by attacking and counterattacking, we should learn to discriminate between virtue and vice. The second is so that having acquired virtue through conflict and toil, we should keep it secure and immutable. The third is so that, when making progress in virtue, we should not become haughty, but learn humility. The fourth is so that, having gained some experience of evil, we should hate it with perfect hatred. Psalm 139 verse 22 The fifth and most important is so that, having achieved this passion, we should forget neither our own weakness nor the power of him who has helped us. 68. Just as the intellect of a hungry man imagines bread and that of a thirsty man water, so the intellect of a glutton imagines a profusion of foods, that of a sensualist the forms of women, that of a vain man worldly honor, that of an avaricious man financial gain, that of a rancorous man revenge on whoever has offended him, 
that of an envious man, how to harm the object of his envy, and so on with all the other passions. For an intellect agitated by passions is beset by impassioned conceptual images, whether the body is awake or asleep. 69. When the desire grows strong, the intellect in sleep imagines things that give rise to get that give sensual pleasure, and when the insensitive power grows strong, it imagines things that cause fear. For the impure demons, finding an ally in our negligence, strengthen and excite the passions. But the holy angels, by inducing us to perform works of virtue, make them weaker. 70. When the desiring aspect of the soul is frequently excited, it implants in the soul a habit of self-indulgence which is difficult to break. When the soul's insensitive power is constantly stimulated, it becomes in the end cowardly and unmanly. The first of these failings is cured by long exercise and fasting, vigils and prayer. The second, by kindness, compassion, love and mercy. 71. The demons fight against us either through things themselves or through our impassioned conceptual images of these things. They fight through things against they fight through things against those who are occupied with things and through conceptual images against those who are not attached to things. 72. Just as it is easier to sin in the mind than in action, so warfare through our impassioned conceptual images of things is harder than warfare through the things themselves. 73. Things are outside the intellect, but the conceptual images of these things are formed within it. It is consequently in the intellect's power to make good or bad use of these conceptual images. Their wrong use is followed by the misuse of the things themselves. 74. The intellect receives impassioned conceptual images in three ways. Through the senses, through the body's condition, and through the memory. It receives them through the senses, when the senses themselves receive impressions from things in relation to which we have acquired passion. And when these things stir up impassioned thoughts in the intellect, through the body's condition, when, as a result either of an undisciplined way of life, or of the activity of the demons, or of some illness, the balance of the elements in the body is disturbed, and again the intellect is stirred to impassioned thoughts, or to thoughts contrary to providence. Through the memory, when the memory recalls the conceptual images of things in relation to which we were once made passionate, and so stirs up impassioned thoughts in a similar way, 75. Some of the things given us by God for our use are in the soul, others are in the body, and others relate to the body. In the soul are its powers, in the body are the sense organs and other members. Relating to the body are food, money, possessions, and so on. Our good or bad use of these things given us by God, or of what is contingent upon them, reveals whether we are virtuous or evil. 76. Of the things contingent upon those given us by God, some are in the soul, some are in the body, and some relate to the body. Those in the soul are spiritual knowledge and ignorance, forgetfulness and memory, love and hate, fear and courage, distress and joy, and so on. Those in the body are pleasure and pain, sensation and numbness, health and disease, life and death, and so on. Those relating to the body are having children and not having children, wealth and poverty, fame and obscurity, and so on. Some of these are regarded as good and others as evil. Not one of them is evil in itself. According to how they are used, they may rightly be called good or evil. 77. Both spiritual knowledge and health are good by nature, Yet their contraries have been of more benefit to many people, for such knowledge may serve no good purpose where the wicked are concerned, even though, as we have said, it is good in itself. The same is true with regard to health, riches, and joy, for they are not used advantageously by such people, but certainly their contraries do benefit them. Therefore, not one of them is evil in itself, even though it may appear to be evil. 78. 
Do not misuse your conceptual images of things, lest you are forced to make a wrong use of things themselves. For if a man does not first sin in his mind, he will never sin in action. 79. The principal vices, stupidity, cowardice, licentiousness, injustice, are the image of the earthly man. The principal virtues, intelligence, courage, self-restraint, justice, are the image of the heavenly man. As we have borne the image of the earthly, let us also bear the image of the heavenly. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 49 80. If you wish to find the way that leads to life, look for it in the way who says, I am the way, the door, the truth, and the life. John 10 verse 7 and 14 verse 6 And there you will find it. Only let your search be diligent and painstaking, for few there are that find it. Matthew 7 verse 14 And if you are not among the few, you will find yourself with the many. 81. Five things make the soul cut itself off from sin. Fear of men, fear of judgment, hope of a future reward, love of God, and lastly, the prompting of conscience. 82. Some say that there would be no evil in the created world unless there were some power outside this world dragging us towards evil. But this so-called power is in fact our neglect of the natural energies of the intellect. For those who nurture these energies always do good and never in an evil. If this then is what you wish to do, get rid of negligence and you will also drive evil out, which is the wrong use of our conceptual images of things, followed by the wrong use of the things themselves. 83. In its natural state, the human intelligence is subject to the divine intelligence and itself rules over the non-intelligent element in us. Let this order be maintained in all things, and there will be no evil among creatures, nor anything which draws us towards evil. 84. Some thoughts are simple, others are composite. Thoughts which are not impassioned are simple. Passion-charged thoughts are composite, consisting as they do of a conceptual image combined with passion. This being so, when composite imp thoughts begin to provoke a sinful idea in the mind, many simple thoughts may seem to follow them. For instance, an impassioned thought about gold rises in someone's mind. He has the urge mentally to steal the gold and commit the sin in his intellect. Then thoughts of the purse, the chest, the room, and so on follow hard on the thought of the gold. The thought of the gold was composite, for it was combined with passion. But those of the purse, the chest, and so on were simple. For the intellect had no passion in relation to these things. And the same is true for every thought, thoughts of self-esteem, women, and so on. For not all thoughts which follow impassioned thought are themselves impassioned, as our example has shown. From this, then, we may know which conceptual images are impassioned and which are not. 85. Some say that the demons first touch the genitals during sleep, and so arouse the passion of unchastity. Once aroused, the passion, by means of the memory, brings the form of a woman into the intellect. But others say that the demons appear first to the intellect in the guise of a woman, and then excite the appetite by touching the genitals, and so fantasies arise. Yet others say that the passion dominant Yet others say that the passion dominant in the approaching demon stirs the corresponding passion in us, and thus the soul is incited to sinful thoughts and brings these female forms into the intellect by means of the memory. The same is true with regard to the other pa impassioned fantasies. Some say, some say they happen in another, in one way; others in another. However, if love and self-control are present in the soul, the demons have no power to arouse any passion at all in any of the ways described, whether the body is awake or asleep. 86. Some commandments of the Mosaic Law must be kept both physically and spiritually, others only spiritually. For example, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal. Exodus 20 verse 13 to 15 and so on, must be kept both physically and spiritually. The spiritual observance is threefold, as explained below. To be circumcised, Leviticus 12, verse 3. To keep the Sabbath, 
Exodus 31, verse 13, and to slaughter the lamb and eat unleavened bread with bitter ear herbs, Exodus 12, verse 8, and chapter 23, verse 15, and similar injunctions are to be kept only spiritually. 87. There are three main inner states characterizing the life of the monk. The first consists in not sinning in actions, the second in not allowing the soul to dally with impassioned thoughts, the third in being able to contemplate dispassionately in the mind the forms of women and those who have given one offense. 88. A man who is truly without possessions is one who has renounced all his worldly goods and has absolutely nothing on earth except his body, and who, breaking his attachment to the body, has entrusted himself to the care of God and of the devout. 89. Some people with possessions possess them dispassionately, and so when deprived of them they are not dismayed but are like those who accepted the seizure of their goods with joy. Hebrews 10 verse 34 Others possess them with passion, so that when they are in danger of being dispossessed, they become utterly dejected, like the rich man in the gospel, who went away full of sorrow. Matthew 19 verse 22 And if they actually are dispossessed, they remain dejected until they die. Dispossession, then, reveals whether a man's inner state is dispassionate or dominated by passion. 90. The demons attack the person who has attained the summits of prayer in order to prevent his conceptual images of sensible things from being free from passion. They attack the Gnostic so that he will dally with impassioned thoughts. And they attack the person who has not advanced beyond the practice of the virtues so as to persuade him to sin through his actions. They contend with all men by every possible means in order to separate them from God. 91. Those whom divine providence is leading towards holiness in this life are tested by the following three tests. By the gift of, agree of agreeable things, such as health, beauty, fine children, money, fame, and so on. By afflictions causing distress, such as the loss of children, money, and fame, and by bodily sufferings, such as disease, torture, and so on. To those in the first category, the Lord says, if a person does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, verse 33. And, and to those in the second and third, he says, You will gain possession of your souls through your patient endurance. Luke 21, verse 19. 92. The following four things are said to change the body's temperament, and through it to pr produce either impassioned or dispassionate thoughts in the intellect. Angels, demons the winds, and diet. It is said that angels change it by thought, demons by touch, the winds by varying, and diet by the quality of our food and drink, and by whether we eat too much or too little. There are also changes brought about by means of memory, hearing, and sight, namely when the soul is affected by joyful or distressing experiences as a result of one of these three means, and then changes the body's temperament. Thus changed, this temperament in its turn induces corresponding thoughts in the intellect. 93. Death in the true sense is separation from God, and the sting of death is sin. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 56. Adam, who received the sting, became at the same time an exile from the tree of life, from paradise and from God. Genesis chapter 3. And this was necessarily followed by the bodily death, Life in the true sense is said is he who said, I am the life, John 11, verse 25, and who, having entered into death, led back to life him who had died. 94. A man writes either to assist his memory or to help others, or for both reasons, or else he writes in order to injure certain people, or to show off, or out of necessity. 95. In Psalm 23, green pasture represents the practice of the virtues, water of refreshment, spiritual knowledge of created things. 96. The shadow of death is human life. Therefore, if a man is with God and God is with him, clearly he is able to say, Though I walk through the mists of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. 97. 
A pure intellect sees things correctly. A trained intelligence puts them in order. A keen hearing takes in what is said. He who is lacking in these three qualities insults the person who has spoken. 98. He who knows the Holy Trinity, the Trinity's creation and providence, and he who has brought his soul's passable aspect into a state of dispassion is with God. 99. Again in Psalm 23, the rod is said to signify God's judgment, and the staff his providence. So he who has received spiritual knowledge of these things is able to say, Thy rod and thy staff have comforted me. 100. When the intellect is stripped of passions and illuminated with the contemplation of created beings, then it can enter into God and pray as it should.